In my search for decent budget PC cases, I came across the CIT Darkstar on Amazon for £34. So I decided to pick it up and use it in my old school AMD build that I'll have linked in the description in case you want to watch. But I finally got around to giving my impressions of this case, giving you guys all the information you might want to know before buying the case, and of course, letting you know whether I think you should buy it or not. Hey everyone, this is Frank. Welcome back to Jaeger Tech. Today we're reviewing the CIT Darkstar, so let's just jump straight into the unboxing. This case did not get off to a good start with me. As soon as I got it off the courier, I realized that the screws inside were rolling around all over the place on the inside of the box. The bag that all the screws came in in the inside had popped open. That is a very annoying problem to have because recapturing those screws is a bit of a pain. I had to use a magnetic parts tray. It did not get off to a good start with me. Other than that though, the unboxing experience was perfectly fine. The packaging was decent enough. Taking a look at the outside of the case though, I would say it looks pretty decent. It has a relatively simplistic design, a nice wide side panel, all black with a sort of brushed effect on the front panel, which I think looked decent. There are two sort of grooves down the front and they have LED bars in them. And I thought that this might look pretty good. Uh, and I say might because mine died after like the first boot. So I actually don't have any footage to show you of them. I could have returned it and got a replacement, but I really didn't care that much. It also has a power supply shroud on the inside, which is always good to see if you want a really clean looking setup, but we'll get to cable management a bit later on. Moving over to the IO. Now this is a pretty strong point for this case. There are two USB 2.0 and you have one USB 3.0. It would be nice to see a second 3.0 port, but I think on a budget case, one is really enough for most people's needs. It just means that you're not reaching around to the back of your case every time you want to transfer something quickly off of a USB flash drive or external hard drive. Then we have a micro SD and full sized SD card slot. These are connected by USB 2.0 on the inside. It's just a really nice feature to have. And of course it also has your headphone and mic ports as well as your power and reset switches. After I cleared up all the screws with the magnetic parts tray, it was pretty clear that they gave you quite a few screws. In fact, I found this with a lot of budget cases. They give you a few more than you would need of pretty much every single type, including motherboard standoffs, which is kind of nice. And I think the reason they do it is because it's relatively cheap for them to just chuck a load of screws in a bag and send them out to you. However, one problem I've seen with this case and pretty much every budget case I've used is that they never sort those screws. And this becomes a real problem when the manual does not tell you what screws you need to use for what. All of the screws that were included with this case are pretty standard. However, if you are a new builder, you may not know what they are. So if you are, I would just go online and quickly look up a tutorial and it would take you 10 to 15 minutes for you to learn how to see at a glance what you should be using a specific type of screw for. And on the subject of the manual, this was also very lackluster. It didn't really tell you much about how to use this case. And again, newcomers may get a bit confused. Moving on to cooling, the case comes with a single 120 millimeter fan mounted as a rear exhaust. And it's also a blue LED fan. Now this fan isn't obnoxiously loud, even when it's running at full speed, and it does come with those blue LEDs, which if you want that in your case, look pretty good. So it is, it is a nice addition to this case. For additional fans, you have the option of either three 120 millimeter fans or two 140 millimeter fans. However, I would recommend not installing more than two fans in this case, because the top fan will never get any airflow because all of the airflow for the front fans comes through vents cut into the side of the case and those vents stop about halfway up the case so the top fan will just never get air. Also, there is 0% chance that you will get a 360 millimeter radiator in the front if that's what you were thinking. Not sure why you would with this case, but just in case you were, zero chance of those end tanks fitting. However, 240s and 280s will also fit fine and a 120 can be fitted in the rear. This is pretty nice to see 
just because it means that you can water cool with all-in-one water coolers, your graphics card, as well as your CPU at the same time. The biggest issue I see with the cooling setup in this case is that there are no fan filters. The front is completely unfiltered and actually, no, the power supply does have a filter, but it's one of those just shocking bits of metal mesh that's just about cut so it sort of fits into those grooves they're a pain to get out, they're even more of a pain to get in, and they don't really filter much dust out, so yeah, that it doesn't get a point for that fan filter at all. However, what it does get a point for is that the power supply shroud is vented. There are holes cut into it so that you can mount your power supply with the fan facing up. As for drive support, there is a cage in the basement next to the power supply that has two three and a half inch drive sleds. Pretty nice to see. What's also nice to see is that there are three two and a half inch drive mounts elsewhere in the case. There is one behind the motherboard. The other two, however, are mounted next to the motherboard. These are a bit annoying because it would seem like they're there so that you can mount your SSDs to be viewed through the side panel. However, they have depressed mounting holes so that normal screws for two and a half inch drives won't quite reach the SSD if it is on the inside. Let's get on to cable management. It's a mixed bag, really. You, on the plus side, okay, I will give it this. There's a decent amount of space around the back of the motherboard tray. Really nice to see so that you can put all your cables back there. There's a fair amount of cable tie down points as well so that you can zip tie all of them in place. Again, really nice to see. Um, however, the, the power supply shroud, it wasn't the best because, okay, so I had a slightly longer than average power supply. It was a 600 watt server supply and it meant that I couldn't bundle the cables between it and the drive cage because there wasn't enough space. For the most part, it's not gonna be a problem for you. If you have a standard power supply, I think 14, 15 centimeters long, you're probably able to fit most of the cables in between the power supply and the drive cages. Obviously not the best case for cable management, but you can quite easily get a really crisp looking build so you can't really complain too much. Although just on the power supply mount for a second, it has kind of rubber tabs that sit underneath the power supply. Check these before you install your power supply because mine were just fucking all over the place. So I had to like peel them off wherever they'd stuck to on the sort of sides of the power supply shroud and then stick them down properly. Uh, yeah. Now the build process, I wouldn't, it wasn't horrible but it wasn't great. Well, actually, I wouldn't even describe it as good. Reasonably bad is how I would describe the build process in this case. Okay, first of all, the motherboard standoffs didn't line up. I took me like half an hour to mount the motherboard because I put it in and I looked through the screw holes and the, the standoffs weren't there because it just, they didn't line up properly. I ended up having to bend the IO shield out so that I could put the motherboard slightly to the left of where it would normally sit so that it would line up with the standoffs. And that is just ridiculous. Like there is no excuse for that. Also, GPU sag was a bitch. I had this graphics card in another case that was also a relatively cheap case. Didn't really sag at all. I was relatively surprised with that case. In this one, or oh, did it sag all right? It has a pretty big cooler on there. So I'm not surprised it sagged a bit, but it sagged a lot. And the reason, of course, is because the expansion brackets are really cheap, flimsy metal, like the rest of the case. The whole thing is made out of cheap, thin metal that it just feels sad to work in. You, you may be thinking, but it's cheap. You know, it's a cheap case. Don't be so hard on it. You get what you pay for. Yeah, but you get less than what you pay for in this case because there are much better options that are about the same price. The, the Bit Phoenix Nova, the Bit Phoenix Neos, the Aerocool Aero 500, the Aero 300. These are all decent cheap cases that are way better quality than this. So don't tell me that it's a cheap case and I need to expect that. And a lot of people are going to buy this case and they're going to have a bad experience with it and they're going to think, yeah, well, I bought a cheap case, so I guess it's my own fault and I'm just not going to pay that little for a case anymore. But it's just, don't think that. There are way better options out there. You just have to pick the right ones. And this is a problem I've seen in CIT cases in general. I've worked with, I think, three now. They've all been pretty damn cheap pieces of junk that are marketed towards a sort of gamery aesthetic 
so that it draws people in who may not know too much about computers, might be doing their first gaming PC build, don't have too much money to spend on it is key because of course they're all really cheap. But all of them that I've worked with have all been pretty shite. If you already have this case, you've already built in it, and you like the way it looks, and that's fine, like keep it, it's not a problem. Uh, and I actually quite like the way it looks, but it's just the build quality that's the, the problem and the build process in general. All the budget cases seem to have their quirks, but this case just seems to be mostly quirks. And not just small quirks, like not, not being able to install a motherboard is a pretty big fucking quirk. So as a general rule, especially with cheap cases, I would recommend avoiding CIT, to be honest with you. I haven't quite worked my way through all of the budget case brands, but I do intend to. So subscribe if you want to see more budget case reviews. And there are already a couple on my channel if you want to check those out. So if you're looking to spend your hard-earned 30 to 35 pounds on a PC case, then maybe look somewhere else. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and please go and check out my channel. I have some PC builds on there as well as a couple of tutorials and a couple of other reviews, things like that. And if you like the videos over there, then please consider subscribing to my channel. I'll be bringing out more videos regularly. Also in the comment section of this video, please let me know the quirks you've come into with PC cases in the past. I think that not being able to install the motherboard is somewhere near the top of my list, but I'd love to hear what you have to say on the matter down below. While you're there, consider rating this video. And as always, this has been Frank with Jaeger Tech. Have a good one.